All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I see everyone is rolling in right now. So we will get started. It is 731 and uh, this will be recorded and posted on our AMSSM YouTube channel. So my name is Kathy Wynn. I am a primary care sports medicine physician in Houston, Texas. So great to see you all tonight. Some familiar faces and names that I see here. So I will be your moderator for this webinar on sports economics, some housekeeping keeping items, um, make sure you mute your mics during the discussion, and then um, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat, and hopefully we, we will get to all of them. We have a really exciting discussion tonight, and it's a topic that is commonly discussed, but oftentimes not executed. So we hope this webinar will inspire you all to become innovators, entrepreneurs, and intrapreneurs in your own institution. So our talk tonight is on how to run a profitable side hustle for the physician entrepreneur with a nine to five. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Clarence Lee. Dr. Lee is a physician entrepreneur. He obtained his MD and MBA at Drexel University. He also is <laughs> he also is a decorated war veteran and served in the US Air Force for 10 years with several assignments. Last being a flight surgeon, he is now an author, an international speaker, and CEO of his own company. So he has a lot more hats than what I've um, introduced, but I will pass the mic on now to Dr. Lee for him to start his talk. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I'm, I'm uh, really excited to share with everyone tonight. Um, I see I, I see one. Who is this? Darren? Can we give Darren a, a round of applause? He has his camera on. I am so proud. Now, so if anyone wants to bring their camera on. I would love to see you guys. Uh, but if you don't, I, I understand as well. But thank you, Darren. Shout out to Darren. All right. So I'm going to hop right into this because I want to make sure we have some time in the end for questions. So let me share uh, my screen here. And let's get the slideshow going. Okay. So let me make sure I can see myself and I can see my slides. Perfect. All right. So we're going to be talking about um, how to run a profitable side hustle. OK, so and I'm going to tell a little bit about my story first. so You understand where I'm coming from. Um, but uh, and then I'll get into, you know, why I think entrepreneurship is the uh, key way for us to innovate in our field, in the current healthcare uh, kind of atmosphere that many of us are practicing in. All right. So I always like to start my conversations in my talks with a slide like this, talking about failure. I really want to uh, not impress anyone or let anyone think they should be impressed at all. So I want to talk about all this stuff, uh, all of, a lot, many of my failures. Um, and things that I've, I've been through, but I'll, fix, I'll, I'll fixate on some of the medical school ones. So it took me five years to get into medical school. I took the MCAT uh, five times while I was in medical school. I failed rotations. I failed board exams the first time I got out, first time I took those. Many, many obstacles um, on my way to becoming a, uh, a physician. Uh, going into business, uh, first business I started was a speaking business. My, my first talk was uh, absolutely terrible. Uh, my first uh, book, um, my first book kind of uh, proposals that I put out there were rejected by several, several publishers. Uh, first four years in business, I lost money. Um, I started putting on conferences and uh, the first conference only had 20 people. So I just want to make sure everybody uh, understands who is talking here. So I've been through uh, a, a lot of failures. And so what I'm going to talk about and share with you guys is, is really a fair game for, for any and everyone. Um, so I always like to talk about my failures uh, first. All right. So a little bit of background on me. This is my, uh, if anybody knows, I'm, I'm the little guy right here smiling in the middle. But this is uh, this is this is me, my parents, my older sister. Um, my my parents got divorced when I was five years old. I just want to give you guys a little bit of background. When I was five, so my dad left. My mom uh, was my main kind of motivator in, in life, my main big biggest advocate for me uh, kind of growing up. 
Uh, my first dream was to be an NBA basketball star. I played uh, basketball in college at the University of the Incarnate Word. That's me in, in college playing. After I realized that the NBA scouts weren't uh, knocking my door down, I said, hey, what am I going to do? My mom was a nurse, and she got me several physician uh, mentors when I was growing up. So I always had this idea of becoming a doctor. Uh, this is me on my OB rotation, one of my favorite rotations here there in Philadelphia at Hyman Hospital. Uh, I want you guys to look up Hahnemann Hospital. It doesn't uh, exist anymore. It was uh, managed by an organization called Tenet, a uh, for-profit organization, and it doesn't exist anymore. So this um, is part of my story of uh, understanding healthcare and business and, uh, you know, kind of kind of some of the things we have to deal with as, uh, as physicians um, when uh, we, we don't own our practices. All right, this is me. I, I uh, did full disclosure. I, I got to put this on my uh, on my failure slide too. This is me. So I, after medical school, I, I thought I wanted to do surgery. I, I did my internship in general surgery and then decided I wanted to do something else. The surgery was not uh, for me. I loved operating, but didn't really like the lifestyle. So I said, hey, I was in the military at the time. They had this, this uh, position called a flight surgeon, which practices aerospace medicine and uh and flew jets in the uh in the air force and so i said hey i don't think i want to do surgery anymore they said hey we got this gmo type of role hey you want to be a flight doc you want to learn how to fly jets and i was like hey you know sign me up um never flew a jet but i would love to to do that so i became a flight surgeon uh this is me flying in a uh one of our trainer jets i got most of my hours in a t-38 um i was uh attached to a squadron up in uh Northern California, Bill Air Force Base. That's a T-38 jet. I flew uh, lots and lots of hours in that jet. My unit did the, um, we flew the U-2. So that black, that kind of black airframe in the back there is called a U-2. That was a high altitude surveillance aircraft. We still use it today. This is me walking to the jet. We uh, flew in a full pressure suit because of the altitudes we were, we were flying. So this was, um, a pretty sick job, pretty pretty cool uh, in, in the high speed aerospace medicine, and I got to practice there in in the Air Force. So it was it was the coolest job I've ever had. This is me and my honey after my high flight, and um, the first deployment I I had, I was tasked with managing a medical clinic. Um, in our host country, and and in the military, I tell people they're very. Military is very, very uh, literal. So um, I was the squadron medical element. I was supposed to be the expert in everything medical. I mean, everything. So, hey, doc, what if one of us gets bit by a rattlesnake? You know, who's got the antivin and where can they go? You know, and what if somebody gets, uh, you know, decompression sickness? Where's the nearest dive chamber? And, you know, how do we get supplies and all this stuff? I, um, I learned so much about how logistics are, are ran in medicine um, from being deployed and actually managing a center. So it wasn't just me showing up and everything was there for me already. You know, all the supplies are already there, staffing's already there, everything's already there. It was really um, something that I had to, had to lead as a leader in, in, in medicine and manage the clinic. And that's when I realized that uh, my education had... Uh, had failed me uh, really much. I was pretty much prepared to practice, but I, but I was not prepared uh, to, to lead an organization. This is me uh, just in, in my gear, which was fun. So um, after my first deployment, I started asking these questions. I said, hey, well, I'm a doctor, um, but I don't know how to start a hospital. Like if, if someone were to say, like start a hospital right now, aren't you a doctor? Like, isn't that what you do? Like you're in medicine. Don't you work in those things? Well, can you start one? Um, I, I didn't really know how to do that, so I, I decided to go back to med, uh, go back to business school. Uh, so uh, Drexel had a, a business a MBA program in Sacramento where I was at at the time. So uh, this is the they don't have it anymore, but this is the building where I, I did a, a business school. And so I I focused in entrepreneurship because I wanted to learn how to start organizations from the ground up. Um, I felt that hey, once a system was in place, once things were in place. I could run it, but um, what if I wanted to start an organization from ground up? So I studied entrepreneurship, uh, formations, how do you start businesses, what governing bodies regulate you, what is all involved in you, the actual business of what you do. 
Um, and so that's what I studied in, uh, in business school. Now, I want to uh, segue into some of the gaps that I realized that, hey, my medical education didn't really teach me. Um, it's, it's very much so, and, and um, I'll just tell you guys, we're all doctors here. So it's very much so a pipeline for uh, employment. Now, so, so we have lots of fields that are more entrepreneurial, um, you know, plastics, things like that. They're more kind of, even, even dentists, or even optometrists are more, and chiros, like they're more kind of business minded. They, they understand private practice and things like that. But uh, many times I felt like I just did not have the training. So there were some gaps in, uh, in the, the education that I, that I had. And I realized that I had specialized knowledge, but I didn't have I didn't have the knowledge that was needed to start uh, an organization. So the, the, the knowledge that I had was really in the practice, but not in starting an organization. So now we're going to get into some new information. And I want to um, ask everyone, what do they see when they see this picture? I'm going to see if I can get a, a chat room. Uh, what do you see when you see this picture? Anybody just participate. I see some people on the screen. Look at that, Jordan, Marissa, Darren, Nathan. What's going on? What do you guys see when you see this slide here? Um, any? Uh, let me see if I can get some. Oh, I got some. Let me get my chat going on here. Earthquake. Oh, half full. Half full. I like that. Half full. Earthquake. Whoa. Nice. So, um, what I would say I see in this uh, slide is. Let me make sure I can see y'all plus see my slide. Glass on uneven surface, tilted surface. Tilted surface, yes. Let me change up my view because I actually don't like this view because I can't really see everyone, but it's okay. Um, so this is the question I want to ask. You know, is is there room for is there room for more? Okay. So obviously you guys have shown up to a webinar. You want to learn a little bit about entrepreneurship. So obviously you're hungry for knowledge. So I just want to encourage you to stay in that mindset and be open to the things that I'm going to share and be willing to learn. Many times docs are, uh, we're very smart, but we're uh, too smart for our own good sometimes. So it, it's hard for us to, to learn uh, and, and try different things. So I just want to encourage you guys, hey, if there's room for more, if there's room for more, I'm, I'm going to share some things uh, with you that I, I feel like it uh, impact your life uh, significantly because they changed mine. All right, so let's stay connected. A little social media plug. I am at Dr. Clarence Lee Jr. on all the social media platforms. I am very loud on LinkedIn. Uh, if you guys, if anybody connect me on LinkedIn, I'm all about entrepreneurship on LinkedIn and talking to hospital administrators about how we need to make more money. But uh, go ahead. Uh, that's me. Okay, so. Now, um, I want to start with this before I get into business, but I feel like, um, you know, happiness is uh, rooted in, in progress and why I think this is important, because as we talk about building businesses, you know, many times our desire is to go after something. Maybe, maybe it's uh, happiness, maybe it's fulfillment, maybe it's more time. Um, but I really feel like that happiness, if you think of some of the happiest moments in, in your life, many times it's when you were progressing towards something. So I can talk about, you know, undergrad graduation, medical school graduation, a residency graduate, pro that progress each year going from this to that. And I have found that in business, um, I can actually pull a lot of happiness from the progress that I make in building businesses. And so, um, you know, at this point, many of us are practicing, you know, what are you building? What is the progress that you are seeing in your life? Because many times that's where we find our happiness. So progress toward what? I would say progress toward a worthy goal, a worthy goal. I build businesses based on my passion. Uh, many people talk about turning your passion to a profit. That is what I have done. That is what I do. That's what I teach other people to do. Um, and what is a worthy goal? You know, you're making progress, making progress towards something that's worthy. Uh, for me, a worthy goal. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, who? A worthy goal is uh, one that enhances the world. Okay, so even us practicing medicine is very altruistic. We want to help people. We want to enhance the world, uh, improve our patients' lives. Uh, those are the type of things that I would say are worthy goals. Um, and so for me, uh, the the worthy goal is to to help to help other people. Many of us we we have a, we share that as a goal, and not only a worthy goal but also a worthy why. So why? Because I'm going to talk about, hey, building a business and doing a side hustle, and it's going to be a lot of time, and everybody's already pressed for time. How do I find time to do this? You're going to need a really strong why if you're looking to go and start 
a, a side hustle. I mean, it's going to be a, in addition to all the things that you're doing. So if you're not really clear on why you want something, uh, it's going to be really easy to burn out of gas when you when opposition comes up. So for me, my why is my family. Um, and so this right, this picture right here is my family. This is not the whole crew. I'm going to show you the next crew. This is all of us. So this was a, a dream come true picture for me. Um, I, I grew up in Missouri, which in the Midwest, not close to the ocean. I always wanted to have a family pick with the sand and all that stuff. And so this was really a dream come true picture for me. And uh, I thought I was done. And my wife said, hey, we want to try again. We want to have another girl. And uh, and we had uh, twins. So uh, we've got uh, this is the full crew right here. And we actually have uh, one more on uh, the way. So I've got uh, six. So for me, family is massively important. Um, as I began to have more and more children, I wanted to spend more time with them. And I wanted to create a lifestyle, a way to practice medicine, an income level where I was able to provide and be present Um for my, for my children, my family. So for me, my family is why I do this. So why people say, well, well, Dr. Lee, why are you doing all this stuff? Why do you write books? Why do you speak? Why do you start all these businesses? Why do you do all that stuff? For me, it's really uh, for my family, uh, which is the biggest, biggest why for me. So for you, understanding your why, why are you pushing? Why do you want more? Why are you interested in entrepreneurship? Why do you want to start a side hustle? That's going to be really, really important. So know why you want to do what you want to do. All right. So now, to the uh, profit from your passion. Um, so for me, the first business that I built was actually a speaking business. And this was me realizing that I had a passion to share a story about basically very similar to what I'm doing right now, encouraging people to get the most out of, out of their life. And so for me, uh, serving as a, as a doc in the military was a way for me to serve. Um, but my purpose, what I really feel my purpose is, is to, is to encourage people and help them get the life that they want. That's what I feel like I'm here to do. So I take that in the room with me when I'm seeing patients because I want to encourage them. I take that into the businesses that I do because I build businesses around what is one of my core strengths, which is encouraging people. So how do you serve your purpose um, and do what you love and build a business around it? So that's, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about here now. We'll talk about this specialized knowledge again. So if you have an idea of something you want to do, and I'm going to be really intentional with not uh, sharing a specific business model with anyone today. I really want to talk in general terms because everybody has different passions. Everybody wants to do different things. So I'm going to stray away from saying, hey, go down this out. Let's do Amazon drop shipping. Let me show you how to do this thing. I'm, I'm not going to talk about a specific side hustle model. It's really going to be general ideas, and then we'll take questions at the end. But as you have this idea, something that you want to do, like for me, it was speaking. Well, how do I, how do I get paid to speak? Like, how do I do this? And so I began a journey of acquiring the specialized knowledge to do that specific thing. So this is you know, webinars like this, this is buying courses, this is me going to, uh, going to events and learning about the specifics of the business that I wanted to build. And that was a specialized knowledge that I began to acquire. How do people get paid and booked to speak? Um, and that was the beginning of my journey. This is me. Um, after I built a, a, a pretty successful speaking business, got my speaking fee up to uh, about, I was pulling in about, pulling about 10,000 to 15,000 each talk. People, I started getting pretty busy. I had separated from the military at that time, and I was out working and, you know, doing okay. And my business, my speaking business started to take off. And um, I, I found myself on the road again, just like I was when I was active duty military, deployed, gone all the time. And uh, some person came to me and said, hey, have you ever wrote a book? Have you ever decided, have you ever thought about creating a product? And I was like, wow, well, yeah, no, I never thought about writing a book. They're like, oh, you should maybe write a book. So this is me um, uh, at a Barnes and Noble book signing, one of my first books that I wrote. And uh, I've written another one since. Um, as I started to speak, more and more opportunities came up to me to, to access platform, various platforms, conferences, different things. And it allowed me a lot of opportunities to do promos, you know, and uh, on, on TV spots. So this is another thing when you're looking at 
um, building a speaking business specifically is what I did was this kind of positioning yourself as the authority. So, and this is going to be huge in whatever business that you go into. But for me um, and for us, we say as docs, and I just want to challenge you guys a little bit, as physicians, uh, we say, well, we should be the experts in health and, and wellness. And I mean, we're doctors. I mean, come on. But I would argue that many times we are not positioned as the experts, say, in fitness. Like you have fitness gurus that are out there that are actually positioned better in the market as an expert in fitness opposed to a doc. And so what does the you know, general public, what is a lay person, how do they perceive influence? It's not necessarily with the degrees that we have behind. Sometimes it is, but many times, like a TV spot, writing a book, being on a show, a podcast, many times that is a really a positioning play where you become more positioned in uh, in the marketplace for that. Um, so I, I started to seek out opportunities for me then to um, be on be on TV. Uh, and so this led to me actually partnering. This is something that I would encourage everyone to do. I actually partnered with my employer at the time. I partnered with their PR a firm that was pushing that was that was pushing content for them. I partnered with them to be a subject matter expert for some of these uh, TV spots, and so I began I, I began to to be the main person that they went to when they were pushing um, different different spots or talking about current events and things like that where they needed a doc to go on and share about something. So I would encourage each person, if you're looking to go into entrepreneurship, kind of that positioning and prestige and kind of notoriety is huge. And so for me, um, I partnered with the PR of my employer and I ended up doing a, a pretty regular TV spot there in, uh, in Sacramento um, about once a month. So I'm just going to bl blaze through a couple of these spots, I would go on and talk about all kinds of stuff. I mean, they would they would ask me, hey, what about heat related illnesses? You've been in the military. Tell us about that. I'm like, OK, yeah, yeah, I know that I've been deployed to a really hot place before. What about being overweight? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can talk. I can talk about that, too. And I, oh, what about, you know, keeping safe on the slopes? Doc, can you talk? These are all things Now, listen to us, my doctor friends. These are all things that we understand at a level that most a, a normal person does not understand. So it's like, can I talk about concussions on a slope? Do I ski? Yeah, I ski. Do, do I run concussion protocols? No, but at this level, at a public information level, I know a lot. So I can talk about the importance of helmets. I can talk about the importance of concussion. I can talk about signs of concussion. I can talk about all these things, right? It's easy. Like it's not, it's not, it's not that hard. But many times we say, oh, I need to be the, now this is what we do. I need to be the fellowship triple board certified uh neurology neurosurgeon to talk about this. And and that's just not true. So I, I will I will tell you this right now. I am a physician entrepreneur. Um, that I did an internship in general surgery in five years as a general medical officer. And I have a medical license in California. And because I have a medical license, I can do all kinds of things as a doctor. Um, and I can start businesses. I can, I can, I can, I can own medical groups. I can own other practices where I don't even, I'm not even the specialist. I can own other groups. I can, own, I can own ortho groups. I can own uh, spine groups. I can own pain management groups. I can own all these things because I'm a physician. So many times we think, oh, I got to do all this. and um, But you don't, you know, you, you really don't. So I just want to tell you guys where I'm, where I'm coming from on that. And so I have been unafraid to put myself out there in some of these opportunities and it has led to other opportunities and it, it's it's led to, uh, to more, su more success for me. So I would encourage you. Um, we don't always have to stay in our lane. To, to our colleagues, we might say, oh, well, where'd you do your fellowship? Like, like we might ask that, but like a, a lay person, a normal person is, is not going, they're, they're not even going to know how long it took you to get board certification. They're not going to understand that. Some, they might understand board certification, but they might not understand how long it took. So they're not going to stand on our level. So I just want to share that with you to to I, I want to encourage physicians, we should be out in the marketplace as the experts in everything health. We, we should be out there. And so that's why I encourage doctors, we should be the ones. 
Um, but a lot of people are positioning themselves as experts instead of us. So, okay, I'll stop off of that. All right, more, more TV spots. <clears throat> uh, started getting asked to do a, a ton of stuff. Um, and here are some of me on some of the stages, business conferences. This is me talking to uh, the athletic department at, um, at uh, Cal Berkeley, UC Berkeley, talking to all their athletes. Uh, this is me at uh, Cal State uh, San Marcos speaking to all their um, for first and, and second generation uh, minority students. So here's another thing. I would encourage you, um, you know, your story is really your superpower. So as you go out and you want to start businesses, um, people really like to know your story. And so I, I just use my story. I leveraged my story to start uh, a business. Um, so these are some of the stages I've been able to speak on. I actually got asked to go back and speak uh, at my, my, my old wing where I was a, a captain at some of the pictures here and here's some of the other places I've been able to talk. So let's get into some business stuff. Um, actually, where was I going to talk about? Yeah. Okay. So, all right. After I built a business um, on my own, I started helping other people do that. And this is a, an image of one of my events that I do. It's called Impact, Purpose, and Destiny Experience. This is me teaching other uh, purpose-driven people um, how, to, how to start businesses. Um, as I pivoted from being on the road a lot speaking, I started to create products um started with books then it went to online courses then it went to coaching these are all things that are kind of vertically integrated in what what i do start teaching people how to start speaking businesses these are all things i've been able to do um and so i i want to stop on this for a little bit so i did all of this up to this point all of this full-time practicing medicine for someone else so I, I, I want to hammer that home because that was the main thing that I wanted to communicate in this talk was I wanted, I did this on the side while I was practicing full time for someone else. And so what did that look like? Um, that looked like early, it looks like early mornings, you know, me pulling uh, you know, waking up, maybe if I'm doing a, a eight to five or eight to four shift, that's me waking up at four, working on my business, um, looking at what I need to do to gain momentum in my, in my business goals, and then turning that brain off and then going into the, into the office. That was me. That's early mornings on Saturdays. That's me negotiating with my wife and my family for, dedicated time to grow and to focus on some of these entities that I was building. And all in all, my goal was to build enough income for me then to make an exit from employment and start my own healthcare organization. And so that's what led to Exhort Help. So I, I, I want y'all to understand because I had other sources of income, other sources of revenue, when the pandemic hit and I felt that like the doctors were just getting slammed. I mean, you had doc, listen, you had doctors getting on unemployment. L look, my, my, my people, doctors were getting laid off. Doctors were on unemployment. Doctors were getting asked to do lots of risky things to practice what we do. Um, and I started to experience for the first time uh, symptoms of burnout during the pandemic. And I, you know, you know, like I'm a go getter. I got this. I can do this. But I started to experience um, symptoms of burnout, you know, couldn't wait to 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 get off of work. You know, going at home is first thing I get there. Have a beer. You know, like I was experiencing this and I was like, I can make money other ways. Like I, I tell people, I'm like, I'm a doctor, I'm smart. Like I can go and do something else. Like I can learn how to do pretty much anything. Like, so why am I doing this to myself, right? So I said, hey, you know, look, either I'm going to leave medicine. I tell my wife, either I'm going to leave medicine and do my other things full time or, and I'm not telling you to leave medicine, leave your job. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just telling you my story. So I'm like, let me just tell you my story. Um, I said, either I'm going to leave medicine or I'm going to build an organization that I would want to work for. 
And so I, I struggled with that maybe for about a year. Do I leave? Do I exit? What do I want to do? I know I can make money other ways. I have this other income coming in. You know, the job is not holding my purse strings so strong that I can't let it go and my family's not going to eat. So I said, well, all right, I don't, I don't feel like God's put me in, in medicine to just let it go. Like, I feel like he's put me here. I've got these skills. I've got this knowledge. I need to, I need to disrupt what I'm doing. So let me go off and I think I can do something better. So that's when I built, I built uh, Exhort Health um, and I started my own, started my own healthcare organization. And so I, uh, I will, uh, I don't like the term practice. So y'all are going to, going to hear me say, I uh, encourage physicians to build organizations. Okay. Business people build organizations, but the business people want to corner us into this little term called practice. Now, everybody feels it might, it might be semantics or I say, oh, you have your own private practice. Uh, yeah, but if you look at the secretary of state, my, my, my entity is organized as a corporation. This is an healthcare organization. It is not a practice, right? So I just want to encourage uh, physicians, we, 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 we've got to think uh, like business people. So, all right, here we go. How do you get started? So I hope this was at least interesting and I've built up enough and you, you're, you're ready to just rock and roll at this point. Okay. So how do you get started? Um, get started by adding value. So I want to hop over in the chat. Um, can anyone share with me, Hey, some ideas of some of the things that you want to uh, maybe you're interested in doing. Maybe it's uh, rental properties. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's speaking. Maybe it's building. Um, maybe it's healthcare tech. Maybe it's an app. Maybe it's a farm. Can you guys drop in the chat any of the ideas and uh, any any of the ideas, any of the business ideas? Not that I'm I'm not trying. I'm not going to sign a non-disclosure here. Don't share your whole business plan, but. <laughs> But maybe just like something simple over here. Just okay. Medical devices consulting. Yeah, come on, let's go. Film industry, excellent. All right, medical device aesthetics clinic. Let's go. Let's go. Yes. Yes. Any any anyone else? Anything else? Rental properties. Amazing. All right, awesome. All right, so how do you get started? Okay, here's how you get started. Um, and it's to add value right now. So add uh, add value how you can right now. So I'll, I'm just going to give examples from my first businesses and, and you can kind of extrapolate like that to how you can begin to add a value where you are. Because many times when I talk to physicians, other professionals that want to start businesses, um, I'm going to go to this next slide. Uh, I want you to add value now with what I have right now. So many times when people say, oh, I want to start this business. And then they say, but, you know, you know my investors haven't come through the venture capital. They didn't back me. Uh, you know, I, I don't have. And then it ends up being this kind of, uh, of toiling of I don't have the things that I need to do the thing that I want. And so I want to encourage you begin to add value now with what you have. And so for me, I was like, hey, I like to speak. I like to talk to people. I think I'm kind of, you know, interesting. Uh, you know, maybe I should start that and add value that way. So I began to just go to my, my first um, kind of speaking engagement. I started a mentoring program at a, um, at a, at a local high school. And I just began to add value to the kid. I started with a basketball program. I began to add value to those children uh, right there at a local high school. And from there, with what I had, which was just the knowledge and my story of encouragement and having overcome these things, and I started sharing that. And that led to an opportunity to start another program at another school, which led to an opportunity to speak at, 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 a, at a school program, which led to another opportunity to speak. And so it started to roll, but it began with me adding value where I was. And so for you, it's like, okay, hey, I'm doing my, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm practicing medicine. I'm doing my thing. You know, how can I begin to add value 
um, with what I have right now. Now, sometimes it can be because I saw consulting and speaking. These are all things where you still end up trading time for money. And so that might be the beginning. It might be, hey, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to consult. I'm going to start this entity on the side where I'm consulting or, hey, I'm speaking, but I'm still trading time for money. Now, that is going to morph into building organizations where you can earn and it's not it's no longer trading training time for money. So add value with what you have right now. So if you say, hey, I want to start an aesthetics clinic. Okay. How can I begin to add value right now in aesthetics? Well, let me go and get some specialized knowledge in aesthetics. Oh, well, you got all kinds of courses that will teach you how to do the Botox, the fillers. Okay. Let me go and get that specialized. Yeah, but doc, but I'm not a plastic surgeon. Okay, excuse my friend, you ain't gotta be. You ain't gotta be a plastic surgeon. You know how many nurse practitioner, PAs, nurses are doing fillers? Come on, now Botox, you don't have to be a plastic surgeon to do any of this. Um, We can do this, our medical license, it's in the scope of our practice. We are well within our abilities to do those things. So, okay, just sorry, I had to do these side notes because you know, we, we think, Hopefully it's helpful. Hopefully. So get the specialized knowledge in aesthetics. Okay. So how can I start doing that right now with what I have? Okay. So I got the specialized knowledge. How can I do that? Hey, well, let me learn how, um, what sort of entity can I practice medicine in as, uh, in my state? Okay. So do I need to be a corporation? Do I need to be an LLC? Do I need to be a, a, a professional partnership? In my state, what entity is allowed to practice medicine? Okay. Well, let me organize right? Let me organize that. Let me get an EIN. Let me get myself an employer identification number. So now the the uh, the IRS now has a separate entity that is the practice of medicine. And then I'm just the person that works for that entity, right? Do I need, and I'm just going to go on this for a second. Do I need to have a brick and mortar practice to do this? No, no, I've got the skills. I can do uh, a Botox and bubbly. You know, we we can do Botox and bubbly parties. I mean, I don't need a brick and mortar to start doing aesthetics. You can get creative and start adding value. That medical license, if you're doing, if you want to do something in healthcare, that medical license is powerful. Now, let me, uh, let me, let me go on this. Oh, two, 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 two minutes. Give me two minutes on this. So, so many uh, professional fields uh, in healthcare are allowed to do what they do uh, because they work underneath an MD. So this is what, what I learned. So I, you know, I, I start working with an employer. They say, Hey doc, you know, we got this, uh, we got this x-ray machine. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I don't really shoot x-rays. You know, I don't do that. I just order them. You know what I mean? I don't got nothing to do with the x-ray machine. Like what, what they got to do with me? Well, well, there's this thing called a radiological supervisor, doc. Well, well you got to be a radiologist to be that. No, 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 no. You have to be a doctor, right? And, and you just got to take this course and now you understand how x-ray machine works. Oh, so the x-ray tech gets to operate the x-ray machine because I'm the radiological supervisor because I got the MD. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, but lab, oh yeah, listen, listen doc, there's this thing called a lab medical director. Yeah, but I mean, labs, I, I, I'm not drawing blood. I mean, I can, but... I, really don't do that. I just write the order for the lab. Like, what I got to do with the lab? Yeah, doc, but see, there's this thing called a CLIA waiver. And in order to get the lab certified so we can do these labs, we need a medical director. Okay. Yeah, I can be the med- Yeah, but the medical director has to have an MD. Oh, so you got this lab because I got the MD. And it goes on and on and on, my friends. This, these are just a few examples of some of the aspects of medicine that are that are able to do their thing um, because you have a medical license. And this is it's it's on and on and on and on. It's MAs, it's nurses, it, it's it's it, it keeps going. Okay, um, but I just wanted to, to say so you can add value right now with what you have, and the MD that you have is adding so much value. Um, that many times we aren't getting credit for the value that we're adding just because we have the MD, okay? So uh, I want to give you all some love on that. All right, so fastest way to uh, the money is uh, proof of concept. So this is um, 
one of the, one of the concepts that I teach about is proof of concept. So test what you want to do. So I, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to make some courses, you know, Hey, you know, people making all, all these online courses, you know, um, let me make a course and then I'm going to try to sell it. So I'm going to sell y'all, tell y'all a really simple thing. Test the concept first. I spent a lot of money, a lot of time shooting a course that nobody bought because I did not test the concept first. Is there a need in the market? Is somebody going to give me money for this thing? Test that before I build it, right? You know, many times we say, oh, these businesses, they went out and they made all these investments and then they just hope people are going to buy their waffles. No, 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 no. If somebody brought money to that waffle business, trust me, somebody had already been paying money for those waffles before. So safest way to the money is proof of concept. So if it's, a, if it's an idea that you have, my challenge to you, if we were working together, I would say, my friend, go and get somebody to give you money for that thing right now. Go, go, go get somebody to give you money for it. And if you can't get anybody to give you money for it, well, we might want to try another idea. So um, proof of concept, fastest way to the money. Um, don't get too dialed in on this specific thing that you want to do. Test it and make sure there's a demand there. Because there's one thing to build a business and to start it and to launch it. It's another thing to build something that's profitable that you can sell and it changes your life. Like it's different. A lot of people have like, oh, I launched this thing. And we're, you know, you could LinkedIn, congrats on your new position. But are you making money though? That, that, I mean, that's a, that's a totally different question, right? It's like launch is one thing. Profitability is another. What I have found is um, many times I've wasted money by building things that I did not test the, the concept first. And so now it's like, okay, test the concept first. Uh, get somebody to give you money for it right now. All right. So uh, just shameless plug on my book. My second book, Persist, How to Beat the Things That Make Us Quit. My story is one of overcoming lots of obstacles. I talk about the top 10 excuses people use for not living their dreams. And even though we're our highly successful physicians, we got some excuses too that we hold on to just let you know. All right. So next concept. And then we're going to get some questions and we're going to ready to rock. I hope this has added value to y'all. I hope that this has been good uh, so far because I'm ready to answer some questions. Uh, the next thing, once you uh, begin, proof of concept is there. I'm adding value in something that I really love. I've proven the concept. Uh, I've gotten somebody to give me money for it. Now, here is the, uh, the, the death sentence for uh, for most ideas for your business. And that's the, the solopreneur, um, trying to do everything yourself. So I, I talk about, um, and, and you know, I talk to my friends and I love my people. Okay, my doctors, I love y'all. I love y'all. I love y'all so much. I, I really do. Uh, but we're so smart. We think we can do everything. And I'll just tell you a story. Uh, I used to do my own taxes. Like I, when I, my first couple of years in business, like I was like, taxes? I can do them. Like, I understand taxes. I can take care of my own taxes. Come on. And then uh, my, 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 my speaking business started to really take off in 2016. And uh, I had a, a, a really big year. And uh, <laughs> uh, I did my taxes. And uh, I realized that I uh, owed a, a lot of money to the, a lot of money to the IRS. And I'm like, well, how does this happen? This, this is wrong. You know, like, this isn't right. Well, no, what was wrong was the solopreneur. I can do everything. I'm smart because I'm a doctor mindset. I didn't get the people in place and get the team around me that were going to protect me and support me. Um, but I had to learn the hard way. You know, it, it took me uh, it took me two years to pay that tax bill off. Um, and so now I'm encouraging people, solopreneur, uh, we can do a lot. We are very talented and we are, we, we, we can do a lot of stuff. But um, build a team, okay? Build a team. As soon as you got a proof of concept, start building a team. You should only do the things that only you can do. If you're building that business, as you prove a concept, people start spending money with you. You should do the things that only you can do. So if you're on there printing out receipts and returning emails and picking up phone. Can anybody else do that for you? Oh, they can't. Okay. Well, we, we've got to get somebody on the team that can do that because that's not, 
something that only I need to do. Someone else can do that for me. And so in the beginning for me, uh, that started with a virtual assistants. And so I started to build a team of VAs that were helping me, helping me with my social media, helping me return my emails, helping me with uh, outreach, helping me with uh, fulfilling shipping orders for, 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 for books, helping me to handle complaints, helping me. So that began for me was a virtual assistant because I mean, a lot of our, a lot of my businesses, it's online, right? And so, um, but uh, where's your sweet spot? Sweet spot being what is the thing that only you can do, right? So uh, in my, in, at Exhort Health, uh, what I have found is, um, and uh, I, I'm a business person, so don't think I've gone to the dark side, but what are the things that only I can do in my business and it's not see the patient? That is not the only thing. That's not something that only I can do. I can, I can hire, I can hire nurse practitioner, PAs, naturopathic docs, other docs, medical director. That's not the only thing I, what is the only thing I can do? The only thing that I can do is go out into the marketplace and build relationships for the business as the CEO. That's the only thing I can do, right? Nobody else can go and do that for me. Right. So if I'm spending my time doing the things that only I can do, that allows me to build a team that supports me and that frees me up. Right. So I can focus on my sweet spot. What do I do well? So as you build that business, there's going to be a sweet spot that is just for you. And so I would encourage you, as even if you have a small team, start to look at how you're spending your time and what are the only the things that you can do. If somebody else can do it, I would encourage you to start to build a team for somebody else to do it. All right. Uh, the power broke. I like this. Uh, I read a book with this title, um, but I would encourage you uh, to get creative, you know, bootstrap that thing, get creative. You know, I say creative ideas versus cheap ideas. And people say, because this is really, it hangs a lot of people up. I don't have the capital. I don't have the money. I can't do it the way that I want to do it. Okay, so not, maybe not do it in a cheap way. Let's do it in a creative way, right? Like, let's use that. Hey, I don't have the all the cash that I need. Um, let me do it in a creative way. And I'll share a quick uh, a quick story. As I, when I launched Exhort Health, um, I, I launched it, and I'll tell you how I did it. I launched it. I didn't get investors because I'm really, um, I'm really big on physician ownership, and so I wasn't, I wasn't willing to give uh, equity away uh, for a uh, for a money partner. So I, um, I built it off the strength of my personal financial statement, and I was able to do that because I had several sources of revenue. I could go to a bank and say. Um, yeah, give me this money. You know, I got an SBA loan. Give me this SBA loan um, because I make money seven different ways. And oh, here's my personal financial statement. And here are the assets that I have developed. So if I did not have um, a strong personal financial statement and, and had built wealth, um, it, it I would have had a weaker position to be able to go to go to a, a lending partner and get that. So that's that's the route that I did. Now I'm not saying you got to go get a loan to start a business. I'm not saying that's what you need to do. I'm just telling you that's what that's what I did, and I was able to do that um, because because I had other sources of of, of income. <clears throat> so uh, streamline your expenses, uh, and then these are the last few. This just some quick tips. Uh, know your numbers. Like I said, I I, um, I didn't really do this well in the beginning. Um, I, I, I had a, ended up getting a big tax bill in 2016. So, you know, streamline your expenses, know your numbers in and out. <clears throat> and so I actually began to learn this. Let me see how many more slides I got. All right. I mean, I'll do this. All right. Cool. Cool. Um, streamline your expenses. I actually began to learn this. Um, I was practicing medicine for a big group. Um, running one of their centers, I started to uh, have to report on the financial. So we were owned by a private equity organization. As the medical director, I started to report on the profit and loss statements. And I realized that the business people could tell you to the T how many patients that this doctor had to see in order for them to turn a profit. They knew to the T how many I had to see. 
what the average reimbursement needed to be for my coding for that visit they knew to the T, right? And so as I started to report on some of the profit and loss statement, how to read a profit and loss statement, I realized in business, you have to know your expenses. You have to know your numbers. So streamline your expenses, know your numbers, run your reports. Even if it's a small business, I'm telling you, even if you just made, you know, 50,000 the first year, run a profit loss, run a balance sheet, run a report, because even if it's a small amount, you want to get yourself in the rhythm of thinking about it in the business and business people look at reports. You know, many times the business people I was interacting with, with the big group I was working for, uh, that's all they really talked about were the reports. Uh, that, was, that was pretty much it. I would, we, we, we sit in the business meeting and be like, oh yeah, you did this and EBITDA is this. And you know, and I'm the doctor. I'm like, and the patient felt better, right? Like, you, I mean, you know, like I'm in there in the business meeting and I'm talking about a, a patient outcome. And it was like, oh, no, no, no. It, it, it's like, oh, this, these are the profits for the quarter. Yeah, but, but the patient did well, right? So on the business side, it's very much about reports and numbers. So I just encourage you, you go into the business, we got to switch our, we got to switch our, our, our hat sometimes and just know the numbers. Um, here's how you streamline. And then we are done and I'm ready for some questions. Uh, this is how you streamline. This is how you put your business on steroids. I began to advertise, um, run Facebook ads. Uh, YouTube ads, uh, Google ads, and um, leads started coming from from everywhere. So once you have proof of concept, once you have a team that can that can handle volume, you turn these this advertising on. You turn it on, and it's like a faucet. It's it goes. It's like it's like superpower. Once you've proven it, and you know that it sells, and you've got the copy down, you turn the ads on, and and the revenue starts to flow. Uh, the other 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 concepts I want to share, and then we'll get some questions. Uh, joint ventures and uh, partnerships. Uh, many times we are solo. Um, we like doing things solo. We lone rangers. You know, a lot, a lot of times the doctors lone rangers. We work so hard just so we could be the one to make the decision. We could do it myself. I'm the decision maker. We work so hard to get there, and many times we struggle to partner. We struggle to partner uh, with other people, but I would encourage you, uh, finding partners, uh, joint ventures, people who share your vision, work together, us together. We can we can go a lot further than than doing it on your own. Um, but these are things I learned the, the hard way. Right. So I went out and did everything on my own. <laughs> right. And then I get two years down the line and I'm like, I wish somebody else was on that personal guarantee. <laughs> I wish somebody else was on there with me. Uh, so so now I teach find joint ventures if you can. Uh, partnerships, you know, create things together, uh, uh, work work together with somebody that shares your vision. Um, uh, and quite quite frankly, that's that's how the, the majority of the large businesses that we hear about, they have partners, board of directors, they have people that that bring and invest as a team. They don't do it on their, their own. And so uh, that's just something I want you guys to consider. All right, we all have a champion inside. And uh, your vision isn't just a vision, it's intended to guide your actions. Okay, so Take that vision and make some action. All right, let's take some questions. I was, I did okay. Uh, I, I what was that fifty five minutes. I think I did all right here. Um, anybody got any questions? I would be. Uh, I am very, very excited to hear any questions. And if anybody has uh, any comments, questions, did this add value? Um, thank you for the people that were on the cameras. That was very encouraging. I had some little head nods like this. I was like, yes, it's so encouraging for me. All right, any questions? So this is uh, a question from um, previous that I've kind of had prepared. Yeah. So as a sports medicine physician, so most of us are sports medicine, um, although this is not considered a side hustle, but um, we often do things for free. We often um, say yes to covering games, sideline. We often say yes to, you know, seeing an athlete in the training room that we might not have to see at that time. Um, we often say, yes, we'll give a talk on a topic. And like you said, it rolls to other talks for topics, but it tends to be sports medicine related. How would you advise us to approach the topic of possibly turning time into money in the sports medicine world? Yeah, so um, I would say this. 
be strategic with the opportunities that you accept for free, right? Have it be leading to uh, something else. So, hey, if uh, you're going to be the team uh, physician uh, for this school or this organization, okay, well, let's parlay that and let's lead that into an article where we're talking about something and not in a medical journal, okay? <laughs> I'm not talking about a medical journal article. I'm talking about news, something that's newsworthy that you can parlay that to. Let's now take those opportunities. Let's get some pictures, right? Let's get pictures of people do you doing what you do. So now you're seen as the expert in that. And I've got some, some credibility indicators from that opportunity. So many times when the free things come along, I would say, okay, fine. You don't want to give me money on this. Okay, fine. How am I going to parlay that? How can I gain an asset that I can then use? Because now if I've got a picture, I've got an image of me on the sideline treating someone, I can use that in presentation. That's an asset for me. So just be strategic with the, org with the organizations that you end up doing, doing those things for. And I would say just make sure you parlay the opportunity into something uh, for positioning uh, specifically. So that's a perfect answer to segue into one of the questions we have in our chats. How do you estimate your value and how do you know how much to charge for, for your services? Um, so I'll, I'm going to tell you how I did it. <laughs> I, um, when I've said, okay, what do I want to get charged to speak? You know, what do I want to charge for speaking? Um, and I, first, there is there for me, it was a number that I was going to make on a daily basis in, in medicine practicing. Right. So if I maxed out my schedule, if I'm an employee, you know, what am I bringing in that day? So, OK, if you're if maybe I'm doing a, a 1099 gig and they're paying me fifteen hundred a day, two thousand dollars a day, what, whatever it is that they're paying me. Uh, well, that was going to be the baseline right there because I'm a physician. There's other ways I can make money. And if I go to the clinic, I know for sure I'm going to get 2000 a day. So I'm not moving for less than 2000 for sure. So that was the that was like the baseline, right? Then as I uh, began to get more and more bookings, uh, and I, I'd tell the story, me, me and my, my wife, I would get on the phone with my wife and I'd be like, I got another incoming lead. Uh, they asked me my fee. I don't know what I don't know what I'm going to say. I feel really uncomfortable saying 5,000. Let me see if I can say it. You know, like, let me get it come out of my mouth. Um, so then, oh, then how I chose what I quoted was the number that I felt uncomfortable, but I still could say. And so um, first it was 5,000. Then once I got five, I was like, oh, let me just throw a 10 out there. Let me just see, you know, and then boom, let me, let me, let me throw 10. So I doubled it until I started booking less and less. And so that's how, if you're talking about, uh, speaking specifically, or uh, if you're talking about consulting, you know, what are the numbers that would get you excited, um, but aren't crazy that you're not, you're not, not, not too big where you don't even want to say it, but it needs to be in that uncomfortable range where you can get excited about it and you're a little uncomfortable saying it. That's your number. That's where I would, that's where I would start. Awesome. So the next question in our chat is, how do you handle conflict interests with your own business versus full-time position, if so? That's a good question. Oh my gosh. Um, so my peoples, and I love I love, I love y'all. Oh my gosh, I love y'all. I want y'all to know. Many of us do not read our employment contracts. We do not read the contracts. We do not push back when the contract says, you will exclusively practice and use all of your energy, time, and God-given ability to further the advancement of this organization. I have seen contracts that have that language in there. And I say, well, Doc, with all your energy, what about on the weekends? It says exclusive? You're a doctor. Like, oh, it's saying exclusive? It's saying that you have to ask them for uh, off, uh, off hours activities? So uh, my point with this is uh, we need to read our contracts and um, the organizations that we work for, they need us. And so you can push back. Do not be afraid to push back and say, hey, uh, there's exclusivity language in here and that's not going to work for me. Like we, we have to be willing to push back and say, hey, um, this is, <laughs> listen, 
this is a 312 hour shift gig for me. I'm not going to do this exclusive. I'm just working overnights for you on the weekend. I'm not going to do this exclusively. Like, no. Um, so um, we have to push back, okay? Uh, and uh, many times the initial contract that is presented to you, uh, an employment contract specifically, uh, is uh, very one-sided. The first one is it's like cookie cutter most of the time. And so if, if, we, if you don't have a, a legal counsel on your team that's supporting you and, and can give you some guidance, I would encourage you to do that. So that is how I handle a, a conflict of interest. I am not signing exclusivity things. It, it, I can't because I'm doing, I'm using my medical, I'm using the value that my medical license can add to the marketplace in several different ways. So I'm not going to go with, uh, I, I just can't say to one uh, entity that I'm exclusively going to use the power that my MD has for them. Like, it's, it's just not, not going to work. So, um, so yeah, we got to go through our contracts. If your contract has that conflict of interest and you signed it, well, we got to, we got to, we got to be renegotiating when it's time for, for those auto renew. And many of them auto renew too. <laughs> They're like, auto renew? Like, what? Yeah, auto renew. Oh, we don't have to renegotiate. No, it's auto renew, baby. Like, so, you know, just um, that's how I would, that's the first, that's the beginning of it is, is just make sure that your employment contracts aren't, uh, aren't tying you up. But thank goodness in California, those non-competes and all that stuff, they don't exist out here. Um, so uh, they're really hard to, to, to deliver on those in California, but each state is going to be different. So just get some, get some legal counsel on that when it comes to that exclusivity, those exclusivity clauses and employment, employment agreements, because it's really going to limit what you're able to do. Mm -hmm. So next question in our chat is, do you recommend starting multiple side hustles or starting just one at a time? Um, yeah, so I would encourage you to do one at a time. So many, um, it's, it's easy uh, for me to come in and say, hey, I do this. I sell books. I have online courses. I do this. I do that. Um, but I really built them uh, one by one. So you you really want to master uh, one avenue first, because when it begins to go on autopilot, I have to train people how to handle that business. So if it's an online course business, um, I have to know it well enough to then set it on autopilot and train somebody else to take it over. Um, and uh, it takes kind of singularity and mindset when you're building a business to understand the ins and outs of it. So I would build them uh, one at a time. Um, I would encourage you to build them one at a time. Now, if you go and build a team or you go into a partnership venture with other folks, then that, you know, and you, you're bringing one expertise and I got the CPA and I got the lawyer in there and everybody's doing their thing. Well, yeah, you maybe could do two. Uh, at the same time. But, you know, for me, I, I built them one at a time. So when I was writing my book, I was just writing my book. When I was building my speaking business, I was just building my speaking business. When By the time I was doing courses, I had already done books and speakings, and I was just focused on building courses. So I would encourage you to uh, do, uh, do one thing at a time. A lot of progress in one direction, not little bitty progress in 15 directions, basically. <clears throat> All right. And then the last question in our chat is, uh, where do you start when you don't know where to start, to be honest? So do you think an MBA is something that is necessary so we can have specialized knowledge to pursue new opportunities? Um, I don't think the MBA is necessary. I will say that. I, I think getting out there and jumping in feet first gives you the most practical uh, knowledge. And so um, the MBA I did because I didn't know where else. I was like, I got to go to business school now. Somebody's got to teach me how to do this. Um, now, if you're going to do an MBA, here's what I would advise. And, you know, and obviously, you know, this is my point of view. Uh, go MBA, I think the most value it can add right now is, is the network. So if you're going to join the MBA program, a lot of want to do executive ones, MBA, you're never in person with anybody, you're not building relationships with anybody. Eh, that's just a bunch of box checking for the doctors because we like to do that. Okay. We like credentials. Okay. We like it behind. I mean, like MD, MD, board certified. That, that. We love that. Like we love that stuff. MH, 
MPH, MS, MD, like we love that. Okay. Um, so uh, I would encourage you if you're thinking about a business program to focus uh, on being in person where you can surround yourself with like-minded business people. And so that leads for opportunity for synergistic things to happen and businesses to be built, you know, in collaboration with people opposed to the knowledge, because you can actually get the knowledge just from being out there. Um, so where to start, I would, I would bring, um, I would just say add value where you can with what you have right now. So what do I have right now? How can I begin to add value right now with what I have in my hands? That's where I would, that's where I actually would start. Perfect. Then I think this will probably be the last question of the night, but it's not in our chat, but what is your best financial advice for someone pursuing a side hustle? Um, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, hmm. God, I made so many money mistakes. Let me see my best one. Um, have a have a have a have a nest egg. So build a nest egg, so that you have a little bit of a risk tolerance. Uh, so many times, and this is what I did, and this is why I I say this. Um, I didn't grow up with a lot, so as soon as I started making money, my lifestyle went right with it. Okay, I'm talking about oh, I make one. Oh, I go to the bank. That they say. Oh, oh, and this is how they get us. They say, oh, oh, you're a physician. Oh, we have a doctor loan just for you. Like, you know, and the bank will give you, uh, look, there is not a harder working people than uh, we will stay up all night, not sleep, skip meals, don't, don't drink any water. We will work all night to pay the student loans back, but we won't sleep. We are some of the only people that would do that. So the banks are like, oh, oh, he's a doctor. Oh, this brother will stay up for three days straight. Like, oh, yeah, that's what they do. Like, oh, absolutely. They're going to earn. Oh, and they're going to pay it back. Like, so um, my, my, uh, my encouragement would be um, develop a nest egg. And uh, so you're not, your, your lifestyle is not matching your income so much. So then once you have a little bit of nest egg, you're able to take a little bit more risk, right? And so you can, you can invest things and it's not hurting you as much because my lifestyle is not maxed out. So yeah, just develop a little uh, a nest egg where you've got, you know, some months worth of expenses sitting to the side and then dial back that lifestyle um, so that I'm kind of living off of a lot less than what I'm bringing in. That'd be my best financial uh, advice for starting a side hustle. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for coming in and speaking with our um, AMSSM community. Bravo. Thank you. Hopefully this is an inspiring talk for everybody. Yes. yes. And um, just a little plug. So for our next talk in the sports economics series, it will be in June. Um, our topic will be on differentiating yourself from the local medical providers close by. We will send more information out there in June uh, through our AMSSM uh, emails and platforms and collaborate. So we'll see you then. And thanks so much again, Dr. Lee. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Everybody have a great night. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.